pace yourself. And let's continue to worship together. You know, it always feels really good when we show that video and I tell my bad jokes and nobody laughs. <laughs> kind of like that. There's a couple of things that aren't on that video. Actually, the first is this coming Saturday. There's two activities. Uh, um, I just totally forgot their names. The Hendricksons, that's what it was. Phil and Andrew, Angie Hendrickson are having Ross's graduation party right here at the church, and so they've invited the church family to join us that day. Uh, join them, not us. I'll be here for the food. But that night, on Saturday night, uh, First Baptist Church is going to be having their summer musical that they didn't get to do last year for Easter because of COVID, so they're doing it again this year, and, and uh, Buddy and, and Carol will be singing in it. Uh, Nick, who else is singing in it? Yeah, right over here. Yeah, Sandy Jones and Susan Fancher. Not Ralph. We don't let Ralph sing. But they'll be singing in this. So what you do, and that's going to be at 7 o'clock over at First Baptist. So you come here, get yourself some, some snacks, congratulate Ross, and then head over there to First Baptist so that you can, you can enjoy that musical. So your Saturday night's all set. Gentlemen, there you go. Date. Boom. I just saved you a bunch of money. Some of you are like, what's a date? I don't even know. But as I said earlier, Pastor Rick is not here today. He's getting some rest. So that falls on me now. Yay, you. The good news about that is that you will probably get out early. Man. Not even getting out early gets anybody excited to laugh or anything else. But if you have your Bibles, please turn to Ephesians. Ephesians, and we're going to kind of jump around in Ephesians a little bit. But as you see on the screen, our title today is, What is the Church? You know, we're, we're, we're in a time of transition right now. It's been, it's been kind, of, kind of strange with, with this change in, in, in our pastor. Uh, it's been kind of easy to get distracted at times. And if you've been at church for any amount of time, you've, I'm sure you've heard people talking about, you know, attending church more, being faithful to that, getting involved and volunteering, joining a small group, serving in the community, all these different things. And, you know, for some of you, you might be thinking, hey, you know what, that's, that's a lot. And to that I would say, you're right. It is a lot. And it's hard to, to, to just try to fit things in anymore. We live in the busiest time in history right now. We have all these gadgets. We have all this technology, all these things that are made and designed to save us time. Yet the one thing that we don't have is time. Anybody else have a, a surplus of time at the end of their day? Absolutely not. <laughs> If you do, please let me know how you did that, because I want to know. We're all busy, and so to add something else, oh, we got this at the church, we got that activity, we got this going on, it's a lot. Because we get into this, this, this rhythm of all these things we have to get done, all these things that are on our calendar, all these things that are on our schedule, and we just go from one to the next to the next, and then you try to throw in something on a weekend or on a weeknight, and it's like, eh. What do we do? The idea of becoming a part of a small group, of engaging with other believers, of coming in, you know what? It's, it's hard. It's kind of like marriage. You know, I do some, some marriage counseling once in a while, and, and one of the things we, 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 I try to get across to, to these couples is that, you know what? Marriage isn't easy. You go into it thinking that, well, that's a whole different sermon. But marriage is not easy. We're not Lego builders. Anybody love Legos? Okay. There's a, yeah, that's Sam. That's what's up. You got, yeah. See, one of the greatest things about being a dad to a boy is that I could then go into like Toys R Us and, and, and the Lego store and all these places where one dude by himself might be a little creepy, but now I have a kid with me, so I can go look at the toys and be happy, you know, and it's not, not weird. 
Any other dads ever do that? Oh, yeah, parents. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Legos are amazing. And you know what? All we do, no, all us guys, we still have our own toys. Like, I still have, have my, some of my toys in my office from when I was a kid. And any man that says, no, I don't, have, I don't have those toys anymore, you're lying. They may not be the little Hot Wheels. You might have the big Hot Wheels sitting out in your garage. But it's still a toy. Some of you who go from the Legos, you start building stuff. Yeah, uh-huh. The only, what's the song? It's a Ray Stevens song. The only difference between to men and boys is the price of their toys. That's true. Except for Legos. Those are expensive anyway. But we're not Lego builders. Because with a Lego set, all you got to do is you have all this, all this stuff, you open up the instructions, you follow the instructions, put the pieces together, and at the end, it looks exactly like the box, and you're done. But it's not like that. We're farmers. Anybody a farmer in here? Really? I figured somebody would be. Anybody know when a farmer's work is done? Never. So when we wake up tomorrow, guess what? It's going to be hard. Parenting is going to be hard. Work is going to be hard. Getting out of bed is going to be hard for some of us. But when we think of what the church is and we think that, you know what, okay, well, I just went to, did my thing. I checked that off my schedule. Like, I've got all these other things, but okay, I, I got church right here. That's all I can do right now. Is it hard? Yeah. But we have to understand what the church is. You know, it can be daunting when we start talking about doing life together, when we start talking about getting involved with other people, when we start talking about giving up something else so we can get involved with the body of Christ. And I don't know about you, but it's, it's, it can get discouraging, especially in this time as a transition that we have as a church right now. I know it's hard. I know that sometimes we think, wow, we really miss Pastor Mark. Yeah, we do. But you know what? God's not surprised by what was going on in his life. God's not surprised by anything that's going on in our church. God knows exactly what's going on, and he's guiding our board right now who are going through so many people who have applied to, to be our next pastor. And you know what? It's not going to be another Ed Moore. Because God knew that the world couldn't handle more than one Ed Moore. He's would never be found. But God knew exactly who that next person is. And it's easy to get distracted by that and be like, you know what, it's discouraging. It, it seems what, by what seems to be such a long time and we don't see any progress. I guarantee you there is. And you'll hear about that here at the end of the service. It's hard to keep going. Sometimes I just have to ask, you know, is, is it even worth it? And that's a fair question. Does it even matter? Why do we bother? Why are we doing this? I'll tell you why. Because the church is amazing. Once we understand what it is, and who it's for. So when we start asking questions, well, should I bother with it? Is it worth it? We should really start asking, how can I not be a part of that? How can I not spend time doing that? So we're going to take a look at that, those two things today. What is the church and who the church belongs to? Because if we don't know these two things, then doing stuff around here, getting involved, it's not going to hold water. It's not going to make sense. But if we really knew, if we really believed and understood what the church is and who it belongs to, then it's something we don't want to miss out on. So what is the church? Well, 
Last week I told you my, my limited knowledge of Greek with the word baptize. It comes from baptizo, which means put them under till they bubble. You weren't here the second service, sorry. I baptized in the second service. But I told that joke, again, I got the same reaction. Nobody laughed. That's not what it means, by the way. But here's another Greek word that I learned in Bible college. It's the word ekklesia. That's where we get the word church. And it means a gathering of people for a specific purpose. And I think we forget that. Sometimes our purpose is just to show up and to check off a box. Hey, I go to church. That's not the purpose. We have to understand what the church is. Saul Alberry, in his book, Why Bother with Church, says it like this. The church is the particular gathering in a particular location of God's people in his presence to hear and respond to his word. So the church, those of us who have heard Jesus' promise that he has the kingdom, the kingdom of God has come, who have obeyed Jesus, who have repented and have believed in the gospel by accepting the King of Kings and making him the Lord of our lives and by trusting him as their Savior to give eternal life. That's what the church is. In other words, it's the church is those who have heard Jesus preach a new kingdom, a new way of life. And you enter into it by repenting and believing and recognizing him as the Lord and Savior. That's what the church is, not these four words. So when we understand that that's why we're here, it's not about our personal preference. It's about, okay, I'm gathering together with brothers and sisters in Christ. We're here to honor and glorify him, to receive from God what he has for us. That's why we're here. We've been gloriously saved by God, through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, through his grace, through his mercy, filled with his spirit, ready to hear his word, to be reminded of what Christ has done, and then to declare that, and to declare our devotion to him. Not just to come and warm up a seat. Some of you might be saying, man, i got to be here. <laughs> My wife made me come. Well, that may be true, but you know what? This is what the purpose of the church is. The church is a place, it's this place that's gathering. That when the lost or the non-believing, when they see what's going on, they can't get away from it. That's what the church is supposed to be doing. We're here to hear God's word, to sing his praises, declare our confession, and it means something. You know, as we gather here today, it's easy to, to, to just think, okay, well, we're at church, and we kind of forget what else is going on. But right now, there's people in London, England, who are meeting together like we are. There's people in Africa. There's people in Asia. There's people in South America. It's, I can tell you right now, my brother's church in Junín, Buenos Aires, they're meeting right now. You know why? Because we're all part of this family. God is doing something outside of these walls. He's, there's other people meeting right now in Shelbyville. All for the same purpose. It's for the glory of God. So it's easy to say, yeah, I'm here. I went to church. But we're missing this big, amazing family that God has allowed us to be a part of. That we're his outpost. That we're part of it right here. Our church, Hope's Point, is the expression of Christ in our town. We're an outpost. So when Paul, he said, you, you see him writing to, say, the church of Corinthians. He doesn't say the church, in Cor the church of Corinth. He says to the church of God in Corinth. It's the same thing with us. 
We are a local church that is located in Shelbyville as an outpost for his greater kingdom. And there's outposts all over this world. And God is working all over this world, even though we don't see it, we don't have a clue what's going on. Because for us, half the time we just come and sit, check it off, and we're done. We forget that the church is the body of Christ, and it's still moving. It, it's, I used to think this as a kid, but sometimes, you know, you, you see the pastor, well, that's, that's his job. He, he, he always feels that way about the church. That's not true. If I'm completely honest with you, I don't always feel that about the church. Because it's easy to get caught up again in all these things we get done. All the things that go from day to day that we have to get done around here in the building, it's easy to get distracted, get caught up, and forget why we're actually doing what we're doing. And I'm a preacher's kid. I grew up in church. I grew up with my parents being missionaries. We visited churches all over the country here in the States, all over the country in Argentina, and different countries. So it's easy for me to get really, really cynical about how the church is supposed to look like, what it's supposed to be doing. It's easy for me to just sit back and get on on cruise control sometimes because I know how it works. We have to remember what the church is and who it belongs to. You know, this may be some, it, it might be old news for you. But if you're anything like me, sometimes I need that old news to be reminded of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Why we as a body of believers are here doing what we're doing. How many of you have ever been asked where you go to church? Anybody? Only one person. That's great. Okay, a few of you. This is interactive. I ask a question, you raise your hand, okay. How many of you have ever been asked where you go to church? Okay, what do you say? You lie. Because when someone asks where you go to church, or where is your church, you don't say, oh, it's on the west side of town. You know the old standard register? Right across the street. You get to McKay, you get too far. Anybody ever done that? Again, you lie. Why? Because if we're honest, the church is everywhere. It's not just within these four walls. Listen, the Coffee Brothers built these buildings, but they're not strong enough to contain God. He's not in this little box. And we get to be a part of it. So the better question is, who is the church? Jeff Vanderstelt said, the church is the restored people of God, saved by the power of God for the purposes of God in this world. So the ultimate question is, whose is the church? I told you uh, to turn to Ephesians earlier. I promise we'll get to the Bible today. Ephesians chapter 1 says this, verse 19. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things, to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. See, a lot of us, we relate to Jesus as our Savior, not as Lord. There's a lot of people who want a Savior. They want someone to bail them out. They want the so-called fire insurance. But we don't want to call him Lord, because that's going to cost. Being a follower of Jesus has a lot more to do with obedience 
than people realize. I know that sounds kind of simplistic. But again, we need to remember that God has given Jesus as the head of the church. He's the one calling the shots. He's the king. We submit to him. We've been blessed in this church to have so many men of God. We had a phenomenal pastor for so long, but you know what? He wasn't the head of his church. It wasn't Pastor Cuno before him or Garut before him or the many who came before them. And whoever's coming again, who's go, whoever's going to be our next pastor, he's not the head of the church. Jesus is. And as long as we keep our focus on Jesus, then we can fulfill the purpose that he has us here. So when we come to follow Jesus, he saves and rescues us so that we can submit to his rule and reign and be a part of his kingdom. So that we can obey and follow him. There's three words that are curse words in our culture today. Obey, follow, and submit. Everybody has their rights, right? You can't tell me what to do. Yet the Bible says the complete opposite. So where are we going to stand on this? God doesn't want conformity. He wants us to trust him. He's always wanted our trust. In fact, you can go all the way back to, to, to Genesis 1. With Adam and Eve. He wanted Adam and Eve to trust him enough to obey him. That's the mark of the church. That we're willing to follow Jesus and to submit to his plan and his purposes and his will for his glory and for his kingdom. He calls the shots, not us. So when things seem to be dragging out in this transition... Remember, he's calling the shots. We should be praying for our board as they make the decision, the tough decision, of who is going to be our next pastor. But ultimately, God's the one calling the shots, and he's going to continue doing exactly what he's been doing. He's going to continue to be moving through this church. Because he is the head of this church. Paul even goes uh, even farther to describe the relationship that we have to Jesus as a church. In more than terms, he, he talks about it as a marriage relationship. If you're still in Ephesians, look at ver- chapter 5 and verse 25. We normally look at this passage as, as something on, on maybe Father's Day, or we talk about you know, husbands and, and all this, but listen to what it says. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water in the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. The church is the bride of Christ. And he keeps his covenant with the church even when we break our side of the covenant. Marriage isn't a contract. It's more than just a vow. It's a covenant. We're saying we're going to keep our end of this thing no matter what the other side does. That is what Jesus is talking about here. God demonstrates his love for us by keeping his end of the bargain, even when we're not beautiful, even when we're messed up. Because, honestly, how many of you would sit and describe the the church as without blemish, as spotless? I don't know if, if you've spent any time with church people recently, but they're not always beautiful. But we also can't go to the other extreme where we're willing to throw the church under the bus just for the sake of us making, making ourselves look better. I see it all the time online. Yeah, the church. I, I love God, but I don't like the church. 
I'm a believer, but I, I don't like the, the church people. And if I'm honest, I've probably been guilty of that too. But we don't throw the bride of Christ under the bus. Just to make ourselves look better. He loves us. He's for us. He's after us. Talk about how awesome Jesus is. By talking about how awful the church is. Because the church is not what it eventually will be. Jesus' love for the church doesn't just tell us that, that, that he loves us even when we're not beautiful. What it's telling us is, is that he's going to make us become more beautiful. Revelation chapter 21 says this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as the bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, no crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And if that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. That's where we're going. That is what Christ is doing in us. He's taking us somewhere. So when we see the brokenness that comes out of the church, let it be a, a reminder of how powerful Jesus' love is and how powerful what he's doing in and through us. He's coming back for his bride and he's preparing us. He's bringing us through this life, making us look more like him. So what seems to be a horrible time, what seems to be like you're just frustrated with anything that's going on with the church, what God is still moving. He's taking us somewhere. All this to say that the church matters to God and it matters to this world. How much? So much that Jesus died for it. So what we make of it, what we do with it, matters. It's easy to get wrapped up like I said at the beginning, in, in, in everything that's so busy, especially in this time of transition, things just don't look the same that they are. But what we are doing here, what the church is here for, matters. God is not done with Hope's Point. God is going to keep working in Hope's Point. And there are greater days to come. If we remember what the church is and who it belongs to. And that's who we follow. I want to ask you to bow your heads. We're not going to. We're not going to draw this out. I know Dell is going to come up. He's he's upstairs teaching, so we got a couple of minutes. We wanna, don't want to interrupt him. But maybe you've 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 gotten distracted throughout these last few months. Even before that, going back. The last year, we had to give up so much. We got to stay home. And you know what? It got easy to just take a step back and not be involved anymore. It's easier sometimes to stay at home and watch it online. That's not what we're here for. 
the Bible says, don't forsake the gathering together. Maybe we've, we've forgotten what the church is. It's easy to just say, well, it's Sunday. That's my thing to do. I got to go to church. There's so much more than that. Because when we come in, when we serve, when we volunteer, when we, that is not to please whoever is up here speaking. It's not to please or, or to, to whoever happens to have the name pastor in front of it. The head of the church is Jesus. We are here to serve him, to glorify him, to make his name known. So maybe throughout this last year, of just absolute chaos and even now through these last three months you've been discouraged you've forgotten why we do what we do then right now it's time to say God you're in control it's not about me anymore What are you going to do in and through this church? I want to be a part of it. Maybe you're here and you have no idea what it even means to be part of a church family. Whether you've joined us to become a member of our family or, or whether you've even given your life to Christ and accepted his salvation. We'd love to talk to you more about that. You can find one of us at the end of the service, Buddy, myself, any of the leaders that you see around here. Maybe you need to say, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm going to make this real. I want to be a part of this family. I want to join this church going forward. We'd love to do that as well love to talk to you more about that. But as we close today, let's remember why we are here, who we are, and who this church belongs to. We are the bride of Christ. Let's continue to honor and glorify him. Father, we thank you so much for the legacy of this church. For the fact that the sun never does set on the ministry of Hope's Point. That around the world right now, you're working. Lord, I know I'm guilty of it. I, I, I think that we're the only ones doing anything sometimes. Father, remind us that we're a much bigger part of, of something. We're simply an outpost, a reflection of heaven here in this place. Lord, if there's someone here who's discouraged, who's lost sight of why we're here and what we're doing, Father, I pray that they can, they, they can just stop and turn their, their, their eyes to you and focus on you. And realize that it's not about the person in the pulpit. It's about you. Lord, I thank you now for what you're going to continue to do. I pray for our leaders who have such great burdens that they're carrying right now. It's easy to look and say, well, we don't see anything going on. It's easy to criticize, Lord, but I pray that you would guide them. Give them wisdom beyond any of their years so they can focus on you so that we can continue to move forward with you as our head. In your name I pray.
So I obviously didn't get Adele long enough to finish upstairs. So, buddy, did you want to give an update? He's like, uh, no. So, well, I'm at a loss right now. Thank you. you probably know more than the rest of us. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I will say this. Uh, the, I, I'm so grateful for our, our board, for our leaders. Um, they've been they've been very very meticulous, very very prayerfully going through all these resumes, all these different people who who submitted their resumes. Um, so as of I believe it's this week, they're starting to go through and kind of finalize the decision on who who might be coming in to, to speak for us. And, and I know Dell will be giving more updates in the in the next couple of weeks. But look, it's I, it's easy if people keep asking, well, who's the next winner? When are, we don't see anything. Man. What, what's going? What's going? You know what? There is something going on. These men, again, they're they're meeting every single week, going through this. This isn't something we just. It's not a popularity contest. Well, let's bring, bring this guy in. This is a big deal. So they need your prayers. They need your support. Because, like I said, God's got something still planned for us. God knows who that next person is. I would just pray that, that he makes it known to these guys. <laughs> but seriously, I, I, I can't thank uh, our board enough. It, it's, a scary, it's a scary time sometimes when you see, well, who, you know, who's making these decisions, who's doing what. But you know what? God knew exactly who needed to be on our, our deacon board, exactly who needed to be in, on our trustees for such a time as this. These are, these are wise men. I trust them most of the time. Until this time. No. But they're, I, I believe they're doing a, a phenomenal job, and, and they're prayerfully seeking God's direction and God's guidance for who our next pastor should be. So please lift them up in prayer daily. Because you don't want to hear me preach more often. Anyway. Well, I want to thank you for being here today. That's, that's the, I told you I'd let you out early. So enjoy a little bit more coffee and donuts, or you can beat everyone else to the restaurant. So I want to thanks for, thank you for being here. We'll see you again next week.